Welcome to the World Around Summit Session 3. Please welcome to the stage, Sarah Levinson. Thank you to our hearty live audience that's been with us um, for the whole of today and for those of you listening um, in the virtual space as well. This is my final chance on stage, so I wanted to reiterate a couple of thank yous um, before I introduce our next speakers. Um, you've had a chance now to meet and hear from Beatrice and the world around. Um, can we give them a round of applause, Beatrice, for a wonderful program today? You also had a chance to meet Arik Chen from the Neva Institute, who is here, and we really appreciate your co-presenting and all of your partnership efforts. Can we give them a round of applause? And then one more for our incredible behind-the-scenes tech crew who have been running two simultaneous programs all day, one in the virtual space and one in the real space. Thank you all. <laughs> And with that, I'm just going to briefly uh, tell you a little bit about this next session. You can read about the speakers um, in, on the, in the program. The thinkers, researchers, and designers of this session ask, what is preserved and why? And by whom? Can a forest be an architectural monument? Why isn't the world's oldest refugee camp a World Heritage Site? And how can new technologies invite a more equitable design future? In 2019, the Guggenheim became a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the second in New York, um, along with the Statue of Liberty. As a part of this honor, it's also our responsibility to be a platform to think critically about the definitions of cultural heritage and about preservation practices. This next set of speakers will help us do just that, and thank you so much for welcoming them to the stage. Good afternoon. Please welcome to the stage, Paul Farber. Hello. I'm Paul Farber. I'm director and co-founder of Monument Lab a US-based nonprofit public art and history studio. Together with co-editors Sue Mobley and Lori Allen, and in partnership with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we released last year the National Monument Audit. Um, and this is a hard copy in my hands. You can purchase it on our website, and you can also download it for free and search our data at monumentlab.com backslash audit. Um, before I begin, um, there's a huge team responsible for this audit and for our work, and you can read about them on our website. I want to especially give a major shout out to our board, led by Tiffany Tavares, here with me today. So thank you also to the teams at the Guggenheim, the world around, and all of you for joining us today in person and around the world. I'm going to tell you about our Monument Lab work, I'm going to share the National Monument Audit's findings along with calls to action and take a look at what's next. You can follow and support our work at monument underscore lab. One idea that I want to keep coming to as a through line for the talk today is this idea that monuments must change. This is a call that channels throughout our work from the last decade and especially echoes out from the work of the audit. And I'll be going into today how we envision this as a new take on the past, present, and future together. The audit was one of the hardest projects that we ever worked on and I think in part I wanna kind of go through why that's the case. Um, but there was also joy and catharsis in the releasing of the audit last September. And, you know, it was the team that held us together. And for us, it was important to push against the assumptions of the monument landscape. We know that monuments can contain reflections of local pride, of forms of remembrance, but of course also of toxicity, 
um, and um, coerced power. And so the key is narrative. And I think just before I dive into more of our work and the audit, I also want to highlight, while this is a work that's focused on the US context, since its release, we've heard from folks around this country and beyond in Eastern and Western Europe, in Latin America. And our hope is that as you hear my presentation, you'll be thinking about your context and how they differentiate and also may speak to one another. Let me take a step back. I'm here representing Monument Lab. We are US-based and we are rooted in Philadelphia. We're a team of artists, researchers, curators, scholars, um, and we regularly work with municipal agencies, cultural organizations, artists, students, educators on participatory approaches to public memory. We started our work almost a decade ago. We began as a classroom project, myself and fellow co-founder Ken Lum, who is also an artist. And over the years, our work has grown. And at the center of our practice with monuments is the idea to unfreeze monuments, to connect them to understandings of symbols and systems, and to not just envision, but also build a society that is undergirded by the impulses toward joy, repair, and regeneration. As a research and curatorial team, questions are at the heart of our work. We believe that art is critical as a means to understand the world around us. We ask questions that we don't know the answers to, and yet we understand that there will be a multitude of possibilities that are explored through contemporary prototype monuments, as well as through participatory research and mapping projects. We value process as much as outcome, and we collaborate to make generational change in the ways that art and history live in public. Through citywide exhibitions, research programs, Monument Lab is connected with hundreds of thousands of people in person and millions online. And our vision for this work is to think about a society in which our ideas about monuments are not um, put into place at the moment of dedication and then left untouched, but instead are dynamic where we can be responsive and monuments can adapt and evolve over time with our better senses of vision and value. In the US and beyond, we are in a moment of reckoning and reimagining our monuments. And it's part of a larger struggle over national identity and civic power. This moment of monumental reckoning is not new. In the US, is as old as the nation itself. Today, we are just several miles away from the first monument takedown in the United States, July 9th, 1776, the statue of King George torn down on Bowling Green and in part melted down into Revolutionary War bullets. And one of the most recent monument takedowns is even closer outside of the Museum of Natural History and the removal of the Teddy Roosevelt statue after a long period of campaigns by local activists and artists. While monuments are central to our consciousness, to our cities and towns, they're paradoxical. There is no single agreed upon definition of a monument. That is a source for instability and turmoil on one hand, and has also been the room for testing, experimenting, speaking truth to power. The unstable nature of the term monument itself is a reminder that stories of the past cannot be expressed in any one story, form, outlet, or voice. For us, this idea that out of the questions of monuments, we've come up with a statement, I'm sorry, with a definition for ourselves that monuments are statements of power and presence in public. We've come up with that definition in conversation with tens of thousands of people in public exercises. And it's meant to encompass bronze, marble, and granite, but also projection, poetry, protest. If you have the time, the money, and the official power, you build monuments that are important to you and reflect your own place in society. If you don't have the time, the money, or the official power, you have power nonetheless. You build your own monuments, or you gather around those that exist, and that's how you make your presence felt. 
as noted, there is no a single agreed upon definition of a monument, and we've utilized ours as a gathering point to really see coalitions of artists, activists, educators, designers, and those in positions of municipality and power. Um, but I, I do want to call out when we talk about a monument, especially in a U.S. context, we could be talking to symbols on pedestals raised above us. We may also be talking about land formations, historic sites, other traces of the past, and of course, utilizing that framework monumental to talk about other expressive forms. When we began the work of the audit, and in certainly in every talk that I've given since then, we realized that there is a common misconception about this idea of where our understanding of monuments may exist. There's an idea that there is some central government agency out there that tracks all of our monuments. They know exactly when they were built and by whom and how much they cost and what they mean. That's apocryphal. It's the opposite of the truth. There is no central system for tracking, maintaining, or understanding our monuments. There's no exhaustive list that is waiting to be accessed, no trove of data that you could just put into a computer and write it out. There are a lot of different data keepers on a federal, state, local, tribal, institutional, and publicly um, sourced projects. So in order to see the overarching patterns and themes, the audit had to be shaped and to be timely and speak to the current moment, especially as a part of in the inaugural guiding document of the Mellon Foundation's Me uh, Monuments Project, a $250 million investment in telling and sourcing a fuller history of this country. We had to shape our work out of other sources. We gathered nearly 500,000 um, records from sources that were not designed to tell us what monuments as we understand them are. Therefore, historic properties, markers, architecture. And out of that, with our team, we uh, eventually settled on a study set of nearly 50,000 conventional monuments, 48,178 to be precise, including conventional monuments from every U.S. state and territory. You can... Um, really, if you want to, get a sense of our work at our website that has our full methodology, has our documentation guide, our GitHub. But before I go into the findings, I do want to kind of walk through process to understand how we did this. So first, we gathered a research team of nearly 30 people um, and started scouring records, again, from federal, state, local, tribal, publicly assembled and institutional sources, which were not designed to track monuments as we know them. As we gathered among our criteria for inclusion were data sources that could be legally used, and we worked with Harvard Cyber Law Clinic uh, to make sure that we could move through as our legal advisors. And the data that we used was officially produced, represented a designated area, and was available in Excel, ArcGIS, Shapefile, or CSV form. We then connected vast parts of this data to build a study set. We built rigorous algorithms, tested them, tweaked them, worked to deduplicate our records. A lot of the monument records that we encountered while we may have found them in digital form, were originally collected in a time that precedes our drop a pin on the map kind of technology and had been transcribed into systems sometimes before or after the kind of modern conception of mapping. And just to speak to that, as we went through this, we wanted to note that data alone will not tell us the full story. There were big gaps in the data. For example, the kind of questions we'd wanna ask about monuments, race and gender included, only six of our 42 sources even asked questions about race and gender, and when they did in their records, they were scant. Analyzing, a large part of our work was really trying to create a single study set. We worked to create a top 50 list of the individuals who are recorded in the most US monuments, and as we gathered our, and we gathered and analyzed, connected, before we shared our work, Publicly, we, we 
convened small groups of municipal art workers, high school educators, monument scholars, and our colleagues at the Mellon Foundation. And the National Monument Audit was released in September of 2021. So now to the findings. Monuments have always changed. The monument landscape is overwhelmingly white and male. The most common features of American monuments reflect war and conquest. And the story of the United States as told by our current monuments misrepresents our history. I'm gonna go through each of these findings and talk about how our audit um, brought us to these conclusions. But just as a mental exercise, whether you're here at the Guggenheim or somewhere else watching virtually, I want you to think about these findings and compare them to your own experiences, whether in your own city or town or in your travels, and compare them to what you have seen, what you have felt, what you know. Monuments have always changed. The audit reinforces the idea that monuments are not timeless, permanent, or untouchable. Collected records highlight changes through several factors, including dates created, dedicated, altered, added to, removed, and of course, reports for maintenance, decay, disrepair, and routine damage. Each and every monument changes over time. Many are made to last with enduring quality, but they're not made to last forever. They require people who dedicate money and expertise to, to preserve them. These are facts that we know empirically, but this often gets downplayed in our consideration of monuments writ large and around the aura of them. Monuments require maintenance, money, and mindsets to keep them up. So our call to action is to build a new, deeper understanding of how monuments live and function in communities. Examine the forces that drive their installation and upkeep in relation to civic power and reflect on how and why they evolve over time. Here, an image of a collaboration that Monument Lab did with the artist Tanya Bruguera, a monument to new immigrants made from unfired clay, which was an attempt to honor the presence, the sacrifice, and loss involved in rituals and rites of migration. Key finding number two, the monument landscape is overwhelmingly white and male. You all probably already knew that. The commemorative landscape is dominated by monuments to figures who would be considered white, male, wealthy, straight, cisgendered in our common understandings today. So we track this top 50 list of individuals um, with recorded monuments in our study set. You can read the full list on our audit, but just as an overview, this is who the top 50 comprises across locations and across generations. There are 11 US presidents, 12 US generals. We did not count Confederates. More than a third, 40%, were born into family wealth. A large majority, 76%, owned land. And half of the top 50 list claimed ownership of other people. There are more Confederates in the top 50 list of recorded US monuments than black people. Our study finds that monuments to men grossly outnumber those to women. Joan of Arc, Harriet Tubman, and Sacagawea, the only women represented on the top 50 list. And there were no US-born Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander, or self-identified LGBTQ plus people in our top 50 list. This overview is a glimpse into who we represent as a nation, and not just in one-off symbols, but in repetition over geographies and generations. So our call to action is to support a profound shift in representation, to better acknowledge the complexity and multiplicity of this country's history. And here, the call to action, along with a prototype monument with Courtney Bowles and Mark Strandquist that on the day they come home, in collaboration with women whose lives have been impacted by unconstitutional life sentencing or who were previously incarcerated at the Village of Arts and Humanities. The most common features found in American monuments reflect war and conquest. Violence is by far the most dominant subject of commemoration. And you will find this in the statues of generals on horseback, 
uh, the displays of cannons and other weaponry, and of course those long, somber, memorial-carved names of local soldiers fallen in cities and towns across this country. Despite their preponderance and the distinct ways that war monuments and memorials dot our landscape, they generally minimize the social and environmental costs of war for our veterans, families, and communities. So the monument landscape has long reflected this country's history of war and conquest. And it also is an insight into the national crises of harm, trauma, and grief. What will future monuments to war look like? And could we reimagine commemoration to foster greater forms of healing and repair? And in this slide, beloved documentarian Jamel Shabazz's Veterans Peace Project, a billboard-sized intervention that we worked on with New Arts Justice, featuring black veterans from Newark in Military Park. And finally, the story of the United States, as told by our current monument landscape, misrepresents our history. Monuments are not facts on a pedestal. They're socio-political choices that suppress far more than they could ever summon us to remember. When civil war is typed into the search bar of our study set, 5,917 entries appear. And of those nearly 6,000 entries, 1% even mention slavery. Even mention it in the title, on the plaque, or even in the metadata. The Civil War was undeniably fought over slavery, full stop. Of this records, of these records, there are nine that mention Reconstruction. Over half of monuments to pioneers were built after 1930, which is after the sustained period of forced and violent dispossession of indigenous communities from their homelands and was right in the thick of a Hollywoodization of the so-called Wild West. So where inequalities and injustices exist, monuments most often perpetuate them. Adding or subtracting a few monuments can be profoundly catalytic and meaningful in their own right and in their own local context but they only make dents into the larger problems of representation. We must engage in a holistic reckoning with monumental erasures and lies and move toward a monument landscape that acknowledges a fuller history of this country. Here alongside a vision of Sharon Hayes' If They Should Ask, a monument marking the lack of women represented in public art on and off the pedestal. So part of the way that Monument Lab is moving from our audit to action includes our project Regeneration, which will be running from May Day to Labor Day of this year, where we are working with 10 collaborative grassroots artist teams from around the country, from LA to Montgomery, Rapid City, South Dakota, to right here in, in New York and Queens. And this is also a part of the Mellon Foundation's Monuments Project. As I begin to close, we can move forward by, the, by embracing the idea that monuments must change. It's not enough to try to complete the monument landscape if we don't respond to the long-standing distortions in the landscape. We cannot look away from what we have learned and what we know, and we cannot put it off for another generation. Monuments need not be the final points of history. They can bridge, they can be portals, they can serve the ways that we bring together the past, present, and future. We know they evolve and adapt over time, and we can put more resources, attention, and intention into doing so. Through new forms of monumental affirmation, creativity, and resistance, we can repair and reimagine how history lives with us every day. We can envision and build a landscape that reflects a plurality of stories and reckons with the complexities, the contradictions, and the contested ways we tell national history. We hope our audit and this search interface will be obsolete in the coming years as more and more artists, activists, and communities not only build new symbols, but reckon with the ones that they have inherited. And so to close, after conducting this study, of monuments. 
We're reminded of the power of public art to shape circumstances, parameters, and possibilities for our broader civic landscape. If we seek to live up to our nation's creed, to learn from and labor to honor the lessons of the past, and we want our visions and values to meet together, our monuments must change. Thank you. Olá a todos, meu nome é Paulo Tavares, eu sou arquiteto urbanista, falando para vocês hoje do território ancestral dos povos G, no país hoje chamado de Brasil, que foi invadido por colonizadores europeus, mais especificamente portugueses em 1500, não só portugueses, mas também portugueses em 1500, e que desde esse momento, então, Uh, perseguiu e continua perseguindo um projeto colonial como imagem de nação moderna. É um prazer estar aqui com vocês uh, participando do uh, World Around Summit esse ano e poder compartilhar um pouco do trabalho que a gente vem fazendo uh, uh, em defesa dos direitos territoriais, dos direitos culturais dos povos originários dessa terra hoje chamada Brasil e como que a gente está utilizando as ferramentas da arquitetura como uma forma de advocacia por esses direitos. Throughout the 20th century, uh, the process of modernization in Brazil was associated, closely associated with the idea of colonization, the idea that to conquer the interlands to domesticate Brazilian wild nature, to conquer the territory, was the path that would lead this country to progress to the future, to modernity itself. And indeed, many intellectuals of that time would call this process auto-imperialism, auto-colonization or self-colonization. That was the words of President Getulio Vargas. He called it a type of Brazilian imperialism, our imperialism. So there was this idea that this process of self-colonizing self is what we, would lead us to modernity and to progress. After the US-backed military coup in 1964, this colonial modern strategy was transformed by the military junta in what they call Operation Amazonia. That was a kind of large-scale uh, strategy to occupy and integrate the interlands of Brazil. And this strategy led to several types of experimental, uh, uh, types of regional planning, urban planning, and architecture that really uh, reshaped and transformed the forest. As many images, archival images that I've been collecting along these years show, Operation Amazonia, this strategy to colonize the interior led to widespread deforestation and environmental destruction throughout the Amazon Basin. And of course, that today we are experiencing uh, the effects of this strategy uh, in the form of planetary global warming and climate change. This is what I call or what I define as ecocide by design. The military junta in Brazil are responsible, it should be held accountable for perpetrating ecocide by design. Contrary to what the military junta ideology propagated at this time, the Brazilian interior was, of course, not an empty territory. It was not a territorial void, as they would say. It was a space, a very diverse culturally and social space inhabited by hundreds of different indigenous groups and different languages. So in order to accomplish that colonial plan, they need to come with a strategy to deal with these peoples that own this land since time immemorial. And to that end, they employed what they call the so-called pacification campaigns. What does it mean, a pacification campaign against indigenous groups? That meant that they were resettling those communities from their original land outside 
their original places of inhabitation as national workers and therefore uh, were emptying out and were opening up their lands for this process of colonization, for those strategies of colonial modernity to take place in their territory. And obviously, the so-called pacification campaigns uh, have been uh, extremely violent against those groups. And indeed, one needs to observe that the violence against indigenous communities perpetrated by the military regime is very much related to the violence committed against land, against the forest, against nature. That is to say, the violation of their rights is deeply interrelated with deforestation. And in that sense, the violation of the rights of those indigenous groups is one of the reasons why we are today facing climate change and global warming. Na margem direita do Rio das Mortes, começa o domínio dos índios Chavante, a grande tribo guerreira que ficou famosa pela sua obstinada resistência contra todas as tentativas da catequese. One of the indigenous groups that were uh, most affected by this campaign is the Chavante people from central Brazil, specifically from a territory called Marawat Sede. And because their land has been designated as a territory for agricultural production within the plan of the military, they were forcibly removed and deported by the Brazilian Air Force in 1966. And indeed, along the years, this region has been on one of the hot spots of the advancement of soy farms. And during 30 years, the Chavante people remain in exile outside of their land. But um, in 1992, and in an episode very much connected to the first UN Earth Summit organized uh, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, the Chavante organized themselves with civil society and managed to return, to reoccupy their land, that is, they managed to exert their right to return. About two or three years ago, uh, because I have been involved in the field of forensic architecture, I was called to produce a map of uh, the settlements from where they have been removed in order to prove that, in fact, this was their original and ancestral territory. So the pacification of the Chavante people became a mass media phenomenon at the time. It was reported in different magazines, in different newspapers, as evidences, as images, as representations of a country that in colonizing itself was moving towards the future. So we analyzed those images in a different light. We analyzed them as evidence of barbarism, as evidence of colonization, as evidence of violence. And by using those images and processing them in architectural modeling tools, we are able to reconstruct the very architecture of those villages, to reconstruct the archeology span of those settlements. So this process of looking at those images and analyzing them as evidences of colonization and colonial violence is what I call in this process uh, an image archaeology. And together with these digital reconstructions, we also analyzed a series of formerly classified uh, satellite imagery produced by the US military during the Cold War that depict this, this territory in Brazil. And despite the widespread deforestation that followed the forced removals, in those images, what we can still see and identify are very clear footprints uh, of the ancient Chavante settlements. As you can see in those images, you see that we identify several of somehow traces in the land that follow the precise arched shaped a form of the ancient settlements. And therefore, in fact, what we could do is to map a very large archaeological complex, and perhaps for the first time, this archaeological complex of the Chavante people that have been destroying during this process of violence, during this colonial continuum, has been identified, mapped, and reconstructed. So together with this process of imagery, archaeology, what we also did uh, is what I call the landscape archaeology. So we did a several expeditions to those settlements, to those archaeological sites, guided by the Chavante elder of Marao Tzadeh, 
who are the really geographers of those regions, the real architects of those regions, and who have a very deep knowledge of those areas. And what was really remarkable to learn and to identify in those expeditions is that in each one of those archaeological sites, a patch of forest, a patch of vegetation, a botanic formation has grown precisely on the top of the urban layout of those villages. Uh, so when you go to those sites, what you immediately identify is that those forests stand on the site of the village. And for us, uh, who have been schooled in Western knowledge, we don't have the sort of sensibility to identify that these are infected villages. But when you talk to an elder, he immediately would say that that patch of vegetation is not a natural forest, but it was in fact the remains, the ruins, uh, the archaeological traces of their ancient settlements. So in that sense, those patches of vegetation, those forest formations, they stand out uh, from their environment and reveal themselves as constructed landscapes. That is to say, they reveal that the forest is somehow also a form of architecture. So when we are looking at those trees, at these botanic formations, what we realize is that the memory of this territory, the memory of the Chavante people, are not only registered in their collective memory as a culture, as a people, but in fact in the very earth itself. The historical presence of the Chavante people is somehow registered in the very forest fabric itself. The trees, that those forest formations are somehow like vestiges, like archaeological remains. They are like archaeological traces. They are, in fact, like uh, architectural ruins of those ancient settlements, although they are not ruins that are dead, but ruins that are alive. So can we claim trees, vines, and palms to be historic monuments? Can we say that the forest is, in fact, a form of urban heritage of indigenous forms of landscape design? And what does it mean to recognize that the forest is a form of architecture in the time of climate change. And while presenting this project and in conversation uh, with the chiefs and the community, we decided that uh, once we recognize those sites, archaeological sites, once we recognize these forests as architectural ruins, we should draw a petition for the Brazilian Institute of Artistic and Historic Heritage to acknowledge and recognize that those are archaeological sites belonging to the Chavante people, that those are, in fact, architectural heritage that belongs to the Chavante people. What does it imply to uh, uh, consider that those botanic formations are, in fact, architectural heritage? There are two implications for that. One, first and foremost, is, of course, that we want to protect those sites. Most of those sites are outside uh, indigenous recognized lands by the Brazilian state. That means that they are under threat of being destroyed at any time. For most, because this area is an area of expansion of soy plantations by the Brazilian government. But the minute that we do that, the minute that we recognize that trees and palms and vines can also be seen as architecture, can also be seen as architectural heritage, we're also doing intervention in the very ways that we think and we conceive architecture and design. Because in the way that architecture was conceived by Western colonial thought, it was very much something that positions itself as an in instrument of domesticating nature, as an instrument of colonizing nature, as an instrument of rationalizing nature, right? And the forest would appear as the very antithesis, as the very negative of architecture, and as much as architecture is a space of culture, and the forest is that space of nature, of the wild, of the savage, that, each, that which there is no human intervention. So when you recognize that the forest, that it has an architectural constructed dimension to it, indeed a heritage dimension to it, that also implies that we need somehow to decolonize our lands, to cleanse our lands and look to the landscape in a decolonized way and hopefully uh, uh, also look to design in a, in a decolonial way. That for me is something uh, uh, urgent today 
in as much as by understanding those, those settlements, those trees as design, we can conceive a form of planning, a form of architecture that produces biodiversity, that produces forests, that the outcome of design is not environmental destruction, but it's in fact the multiplication of biodiversity. In the context of the Anthropocene, in the context of climate change and global warming, uh, to find new ways of conceiving design is, of course, a matter of urgency. And this design, in many different ways, does not need to be uh, invented anew because it already exists. And it exists in, in the ways in which those indigenous cultures are handling the land. It exists in the way uh, they manifest in the very architecture of the forest as a ruin. Door, take one. Phone? Maybe should we... That was good. One, two, three. I am Sandy Hilal, co-founder of uh, DAR, Decolonizing Architecture, Art and Research, together with uh, Alessandro Petti. In the last now almost five years, we actually have been living in Stockholm, where actually we are speaking today uh, from uh, our studio. Our artistic practice maybe situate itself in the relation between architecture, politics and arts. Dar in Arabic actually means home. And uh, the first time when we established uh, Dar, we, we established it in, in our house. And then when we arrived to Palestine, we were faced with what does it mean actually for us as, as architects to understand and to link architecture and uh, decolonization. We were thinking, what does it mean today? Actually learning from Palestine and particularly learning from refugee camps. How can we understand Europe today through lenses from where refugee camps are at the center of our thoughts and not the metropolis? And I think that this stands very strongly at the, at the base of our latest projects on how today we can bring Palestine, learn from Palestine in a place like Europe. This was very true uh, for the Hesho refugee camp, which is a, a Palestinian refugee camp that was established uh, at the beginning of the Nakba in uh, 1948 and is located in, uh, in Bethlehem. In the context of Palestine, the Hesha also uh, played historically a very important role against um, the colonization, Israeli colonization of Palestine. The camp is looked at only as a relief place where people are in the need of a help, while on the everyday practice, it was so clear that these people are able to live beyond the state, are able to organize their life in, an, in a very interesting way, beyond any concept of public and private. The concept of being neighbors has been radically shifted in refugee camps. The concepts of being self-organized and understand how life can run with the support of uh, the relations that you have in the camp has been extremely inspiring. And of course, we recognize and acknowledge the fact that camps are crimes, that they should not have been established since the first beginning. But, but after 70 years of life in refugee camps, we cannot keep on negating the camp. There are generations that born in the camp and know the camp as only reality. And, and to find young people negating their own life because it should not have existed by, uh, uh, by, by definition is something that we felt was radically unfair and, and that the narration need to be rethought. 
how can camps also be looked at as place where people are able to build their own stories, to build valuable life, to understand that they can love the camp, this is part of who they are, instead of looking at them only as miserable people. How can we actually oblige ourselves, the world, and everybody around us to recognize that value of that temporary realities? And indeed, this is where we ended up by arriving to a platform like the UNESCO and, and how can we nominate the camp as an important uh, site for uh, heritage today in the world. We also dare to ask a very difficult questions with all the people that we work with, which is do refugee camp actually have a history? Because in the specific case, of course, of Palestine, that any recognition of that history would mean undermining the right of return. So over um, more than now seven years, um, we uh, produce uh, this book, which is the um, nomination dossier. The ultimate goal is not necessarily the recognition of the Haitian refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin as a World Heritage Site, but for us, was, what is still uh, even more important is to acknowledge the discussions that were in the process itself. You know, when we started within the community, asking those questions and collecting different stories and different kind of evolution of the architecture in the camp itself, but also at the same time um, challenging a common understanding of heritage that uh, somehow exclude um, sites that are not considered to be as a world heritage site. So the Haitian refugee camp is nominated for description on the World Heritage List according to criteria four and criteria six. It needs to be an outstanding example of a type of a building of architectural and technological ensemble or a, a landscape which illustrates significant stage in human history. Meanwhile, the criteria number six be directly or tangibly associated with events or living traditions, with ideas or with belief, with artistic and literary works of outstanding universal significance. So for the Haitia, the criteria number four, the Haitia refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin typologically embodies the memory of the Nakba, which is the longest and the largest living displacement in the world and is at the same time the expression of an exceptional, spatial, social and political form. For criteria number six, the Hesha refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin is associated with an exceptional belief in the right of return, which has inspired both refugees and non-refugees from around the world in the struggle for justice and equality. Indeed, if we want to think about heritage, this is what every Palestinian and every uh, person that loves justice in life would list as the main important heritage for Palestine today, if not for the world today. This would require both the Palestinian state and the Israeli state, because the 44 villages are located right now in uh, what uh, in, in Israel. So in that sense, it would require post both the Palestinian state and the Israeli state to go to UNESCO to recognize the Nakba, not to recognize what really happened, to recognize the rupture of the Palestinian life. And this is a very hard nomination to arrive to UNESCO, yet that is not reason enough for us as architects and, and artists and, and supporters for justice to say this is what it should be. If our institutions are re not ready for this, we should bring that to the eye of everybody and discuss it and understand how we as Palestinians and, and supporters for, for the, the cause understand if that is what we meant as heritage, then let's work it out. What does that mean and how can we understand it and, and how can we go to UNESCO with this request? This project would love to give also a light on that other side that is also a side of everyday life of the camp, of, of the people in the camp and if refugees in the camp being the leaders for the struggle for freedom and, and, uh, and justice. And this project would like to actually 
give the, the, the struggle to the freedom of movement and the freedom of refugees to move between the camp and the villages and the freedom of movement in any place they want as a basic human rights and indeed their all struggle of the past 70 years and the recognize, recognition of that struggle is also recognition of our right as humans to be able to move freedom in, in, in freely in the world where we are living today. Thinking only that UNESCO is applicable to states means that we are leaving out so many people that are not today represented by the states and only because they are not represented by the states as if they don't have place in history. So indeed, this project aim even for more than uh, applying to UNESCO is aiming for making questions. So we have learned a lot in looking at the uh, refugee camp as a site that can, can really undermine these modernist categories that are still um, um, colonizing our minds. So that, uh, I think, is some of the aspect that we hope to, to try to, uh, to bring from the refugee heritage to engage with different difficult heritage or, or, or situations where one can create the different narrations about the users of, uh, of these buildings. Please welcome to the stage, Miriam Halawi Abraham. Hello. So the work I'll be sharing with you today is called the Abyssinian Cyber Vernaculus. It's a series of visual narratives and virtual reality experiences um, that unfold over the rock hewn churches of Lalibela in northern Ethiopia. This work was born from an exercise of imagination, or rather reimagination, an exercise that materialized in order to bypass the nefarious hegemonies surrounding my Ethiopian heritage um, that have not only frustrated me in my endeavors towards inquiring deeper into histories and imagining beyond the given, but have also effectively barred 
the black subject from contributing to the canon, claiming space and determining futures. Furthermore, this work attempts to uncover and reinstate the presence of those marginalized and maligned by the dominant conservative ethos of contemporary Ethiopian society while pushing up against apocryphal stories of Africa. Through immersive storytelling and myth-making, the Abyssinian cyber vernaculus activates the existing architecture of the site through three parallel narratives constructed around the perspectives of the self-proclaimed experts um, of Lalibela. The three engineers of hegemonic narratives are the Western academic, um, or the white savior, uh, portrayed by um, a spoof of Indiana Jones called Kentucky Johnson, um, the conservative Coptic Orthodox Ethiopian man represented by Johannes the Faithful. Um, and lastly, we have Sabi the Hotep, which is lo loosely defined as a pro-black yet socially conservative cisgendered male. Um, in each instance, the player assumes the role uh, of one of these heroes in VR and drives the narrative forward, ultimately, go un ultimately going on an unexpected journey of unlearning. Historically known as Roja, the town of Lalibela was the royal capital of the Zagwe dynasty, which reigned from the 10th to the 13th century. The complex is made up of 11 churches carved from a single living rock of basalt, a, a soft volcanic rocky massive. The churches are an active site of pilgrimage and worship for Ethiopian Christians, and the site became the first landmark project of the World Monument Fund after the organization's foundation in 1965. Um, later officially designated a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1978. Since then, Dalibela has become a focus of global tourism and international conservation efforts. As the Hegelian myths that treated Africa as ahistorical and external to modernity informed Western worldviews, conservationists and institutions in the global north presumed authority over African cultural production. Africans were not believed capable of correctly preserving their heritage. As such, nations like Ethiopia are still striving for the repatriation of artifacts looted from churches and palaces. For me, nothing in popular culture supports this sentiment more than Indiana Jones's famous catchphrase, it belongs in a museum. Whose museum and says who? Indiana Jones has spawned an endless array of fictional tropes where the hero uh, where the heroic white adventurer races across the world, risking their lives uh, to retrieve ancient relics from ethnic um, and exotic places where they encounter other racial stereotypes. Indiana Jones and the world he inhabited became the starting point for my um, critical world building. What would Indiana Jones do in the context of Lalibela? How would the priests and deacons of the church react to his antics when they're already so easily dismayed by any young person walking into the church without proper attire or the required level of piety? As you can see, like, as you can see with this um, dismay on the priest here. I set out to build this first VR experience by subverting tropes of traditional gameplay and weaving humor and satire into the character's dialogue. The player learns of their mission to retrieve the seven kilogram Afro Aigaba gold cross through Kentucky's internal dialogue. The game relies on the player's preconceived expectations of gameplay to deceive them into believing that they can advance through the game by collecting objects. However, this quickly leads them to a moral dilemma when they reach the main, the main objective and Kentucky's inner voice argues to take it to a museum where it belongs while the church members warn the player not to loot the church. When it comes to myth, Lalibela is a place steeped in it. To the extent that its legend takes precedence over scientific research or any new findings. According to legend, um, a swarm of bees encircled a young Lalibela at his birth. Their appearance indicated a prophecy that Lalibela was destined to be king. The angel Gabriel came to visit him in his youth in a vision and carried him on his wings to the heavens where he saw the 10 rocky wind churches. There he realized it was his destiny to construct a new Jerusalem for his people upon earth. During his reign, Lalibela enlisted uh, the help of hundreds of workers to carve away at the bedrock. For each cubit a worker dug by day, an angel would descend to dig three cubits by night. 
the construction of the churches were, was therefore apparently completed in under 24 years. The king, now a venerated saint of the Tawahido Orthodox Church, was allegedly buried in a tomb inside Vita Golgotha Mikhail, co commingling myth with bone and earth and becoming the namesake of the city now known as Lalibela. Experts studying the construction anomalies have suggested that the churches may have been completed through a phased construction over centuries and may have in fact been intended as a fortified royal residence. One of the peculiar things about the site is the missing debris. Often monolithic sites have mounds of excavated debris nearby or on site. However, experts have not been able to locate the debris. Uh, in recent years, they've been using satellite imagery to recognize spoil heaps and have since excavated a domestic dwelling that may date back to the 10th century. This opens up a whole floodgate of questions on the origins of the churches. Archaeologists have also pointed to the evidence of the presence of other groups, such as potentially ambassadors from the Gupta Empire in India, which, ind which is indicated by the symbolic windows, um, symbolic windows on the face of Beta Mariam, as well as metallic shields embedded in the, sh in the ceiling of its interior. Raising any such questions during a tour, however, um, is met by swift dismissal and is sometimes even regarded as heresy. So the intent behind my second narrative is to weaken the potency of this myth by devising one that can prove to be its antithesis. I worked through a process, process of myth-making where I could imply plausible yet fictional alternatives, allowing for a multiplicity rather than the singularity of the per persistent myth of Lalibela. It was a practice of counter-memory and a sort of intentionally disruptive heresy. The new myth claims that the last ruler of the Aksumite um, empire enlisted the help of the guild of Tahanesi, an imaginary ancient guild made up of members of various empires. The guild was responsible for the construction of other iconi iconic monoliths all over the world as well. They achieved these impossible tasks through the use of mechanized carving machines and hand tools. As the symbolism of Lalibela's churches and the monotheistic and imperial nature of their lore is further sedimented into the homogenized concept of Ethiopianism, a national identity hinged on Ethiopian exceptionalism, the myth for me becomes increasingly important to combat. The Abyssinian Empire has been widely regarded as a symbol of black sovereignty and triumph over colonization by the afro diasporic community globally. Yet this not only sanctifies monarchs and r romanticizes their legacies, but it also allows the dominant culture to avoid a reckoning with the violence of its past. During this critical moment in our political history, when a war rages on for over 15 months, truth has become askew, ghosts of rulers' pasts are conjured as a way to wage nationalism and male bravado, silent compliance is violently enforced. So a confrontation with Ethiopia's imperial past and its resulting social injustices is urgently needed. The Horn of Africa in general has a long history of fierce and ruthless queens whose stories have now either been eroded, sanitized, or skewed. The biblical queen of Sheba, Nigis Saba, is said to have ruled over ancient Abyssinia extending to Yemen. In Ethiopia, the Solomonic dynasty draws its lineage from Nigis Saba and King Solomon, subsuming her character into imperial Christian imagination. In other versions, um, Saba uh, is also referred to as Bilkis, a goddess in her own right, or the daughter of a jinn or a seductive demoness. Other powerful women of history from the region include Queen Yodit, who set ablaze to the kingdom of Aksum uh, and dismantled it, Queen Fura of Sidama, and Queen Aruela of Somalia. In my search for one, I ran into the other, their identities conflated with each other. So rather than entangling them from each other and drawing out one true benevolent version from all these disparate identities, I settled for creating a many-faced god hidden in the shadows of history, but never powerless. The Ethiopian Oromo goddess Atete, who rules over the fate of people on earth, presides over the Zar. In this tradition, Zar can commune with humans and offer them advice through a host during a trance. And the practice of communing with Zar and spirit possession is seen across Sudan and Egypt as well. However, in other belief systems throughout Ethiopia, 
um, that are often seen as malevolent spirits that, re that are responsible for socially unacceptable behaviors um, such as a non-masculine man or a willful and assertive woman and must be purged or cast away rather than accepted or appeased. To me, this appears as a sort of coded identity to conceal the true nature of certain groups among conservative societies. The Tsar in the VR experience are conjured by the unnamed goddess. As she calls forth those who've been banished to non-existence by patriarchy and religion. Here we'll have um, a short clip from inside the virtual world of the Abyssinian cyber vernaculars. Ah, but you get a load of this. The medieval churches of Lalibela, eighth wonder of the world. Eleven churches carved from a single rock. <sighs> okay, Kentucky, stay focused. You're here to recover Afro Aegba, the seven kilogram gold cross of King Lalibela. It's one of the most powerful spiritual devices in the world. Hey, mister, I can show you around. I know my way around all the churches. Boy, this would be worth a pretty penny on the black market. Appa, did you see Hush, man, come. Don't make us. Let my now just keep an eye on him from a distance. The cross must be just beyond that pillar. Wait, what are you doing? You can't go back there. It's forbidden. I need to get that cross. I have to take it to a museum where it belongs. A sigh. I've been dreaming of coming here my whole life. You must have heard the legend of Nugus Lalibela before, no? He carved this church from a single rock himself with only the help of the angels of heaven in just 24 years. Are you just going to stand there listening to this man tell the same story you've heard all your life? Come with me if you seek answers. Araba Mara? What kind of sorcery is this? The guild was a group of anonymous skilled artisans from around the world. They specialized in rock-cut architecture an incredibly arduous and nearly impossible feat of chiseling temples, castles, cities even, from bedrock. Salam, stranger. Grab a tour and join us. We need all the help we can get. Salas AI. The road to Zion has been one long one indeed, Cha. But I'm here at last. Lali Bella, the promised land. For how much they despise me, they cannot destroy me. I am what the energy in all things, the entropy after death. I lurk in the shadows they banish me to and strike when I see weakness. No man's kingdom is made to last, especially those built on bloodlust and greed. Neither they nor you can ever be rid of me. I am the brightness in your skin, the sunlight you absorb. I am your beating heart and your blistering dream. So my work began as a series of comic books, yet I immediately wished to move the narrative into a more expansive, non-extractive medium that would allow for an audience to be immersed in the disjointed saga um, and dwell within a space that for most is too distant, difficult to navigate, or impossible to access due to its present conditions. While virtual reality is still an emerging media that is um, not yet fully formalized and institutionalized, I see it as an unclaimed territory for black emancipatory imagination and a vital tool for self-representation for the othered rather than just a popular um, entertainment commodity. It creates the opportunity for virtual embodiment where the player can assume the identity of a character and maintain some agency by controlling their movements um, and actions, yet gain no control over the character's thoughts, words, or prejudices. This leads to complex moments of resistance um, and complic complicity, as well as confrontations and consequences of actions in a world with a different set of rules to our own. Virtual reality can be a space for experimental conservation of heritage sites. 
the conservation effort here is not intended to be neutral or produce an exact facsimile of the object, but rather is a sort of digital mediation that counters erasure by preserving a certain version of the object imbued with certain meaning, with enough breadth to allow for multiplicity and varied interpretations. With the support of the Graham Foundation in 2020, I've been able to work towards developing the next iteration of the project. I've continued my process of spatial interpretation and digitization following a recent visit to La Libella, and I plan on producing an exhibition that blurs the boundaries between this virtual world and physical space. Design is ultimately a mechanism of self-affirmation, a method of driving preferable futures and worldviews, and as blackness has been historically banished to the margins, the realms of the exotic, the unknown and unknowable, the politics of design and space making emboldens us to reinforce black subjectivity and claim uncharted territories, asserting and centering ourselves in multiple futures. Thank you. Soy Sebastián López Brac, fotógrafo y artista visual argentino, documentando la importancia cultural y ambiental de los humedales más importantes de Latinoamérica. Nací en la ciudad de Rosario, Argentina, y crecí jugando en las aguas del gran río Paraná. Este gran río nace en Brasil, hasta su desembocadura en el río de la Plata para luego terminar en el mar. Su recorrido tiene una extensión aproximada de 2.500 kilómetros. En este último tramo conforma el Delta del Paraná, uno de los ecosistemas más biodiversos e importantes de América Latina. Los humedales son ecosistemas híbridos entre sistemas acuáticos y terrestres. Grandes extensiones de superficies de tierras que se encuentran anidadas e inundadas en forma temporal o permanente. Estas tierras contienen las mareas durante los periodos de lluvia intensas y crecidas de los ríos. A nivel global se calcula que los humedales cubren aproximadamente 12 millones de kilómetros cuadrados. En Argentina estos ecosistemas representan el 21% del territorio del país. Lamentablemente se estima que estamos perdiendo más del 35% desde 1970 hasta la fecha. Los humedales están desapareciendo mucho más rápido que los bosques nativos. En esta zona antiguamente habitaban los Chanatimbúes, una etnia indígena que se desplazaba en canoa por las aguas del río, pescando y cazando para subsistir. Hoy en día hay muchas familias habitando los humedales. En su mayoría continúan sosteniendo la, la pesca artesanal como modo de vida y tradición cultural. Las viviendas suelen estar elevadas del suelo para protegerlas de las crecidas y son autos construidos con materiales reciclados y adquiridos en la ciudad. Si bien las comunidades isleñas siempre tuvieron la capacidad de adaptarse y acomodarse en un territorio cambiante, las transformaciones antrópicas que hoy sufren los humedales lamentablemente están poniendo en peligro toda la vida y la cultura del mar. El río Paraná, siendo uno de los más extensos y caudalosos del planeta, está pasando por el peor descenso registrado. Este paisaje sin agua es un paisaje muerto, carente de alma. Este descenso sin precedente y prolongado del río Paraná provocó la desaparición de lagunas, arroyos y otros cursos de agua, dificultando la movilidad de las comunidades que viven más adentro y se trasladan en canoas, imposibilitándolos del acceso a las ciudades más cercanas en busca de suministros o alguna atención médica. Además, con este descenso extremo del río, un valioso y vital recurso como es el agua empieza a escasear poniendo aún más en peligro la salud de toda la comunidad que habita en este ecosistema. Pero este no es el único problema en que se enfrenta este ecosistema. Desde el principio del 2020, todo el delta del Paraná está siendo devastado por el fuego. Los incendios ya han destruido más de un millón de hectáreas. Esto equivale aproximadamente a 40 veces la superficie de Buenos Aires. Esto 
estos incendios son producidos de manera ilegal por empresarios ganaderos y o inmobiliarios que buscan generar mayores extensiones de tierras aptas para la actividad. También está claro que la bajante del río y la histórica sequía en la región causada por el cambio climático son factores que contribuyen en la propagación de los fuegos poniendo en riesgo aún más el equilibrio del ecosistema y profundizando el cambio climático. La magnitud de los incendios provocados en la región deja múltiples consecuencias como la mortandad en los animales, la pérdida de, del hábitat, el empobrecimiento del suelo, la contaminación del agua y del aire, además de representar un riesgo muy alto a la salud de los habitantes de las islas. En mi región, las principales causas de desaparición de los humedales son la deforestación para la industria ganadera que exporta carnes al mundo, el avance desmedido de la urbanización ilegal a través de los negocios inmobiliarios, la construcción ilegal de terraplenes que modifican todos los cauces del agua, la pesca industrial que depreda la fauna histícola, eh, pese a que estamos en una emergencia hídrica, eh, la exportación de soja a través de grandes buques que van deteriorando las costas y la profundidad del río, las hidroeléctricas construidas más arriba que modifican todo el cauce de, del río a su antojo, la contaminación del agua por los desechos industriales y cloacales arrojados por las grandes ciudades, la extracción de grandes cantidades de arenas destinadas al fracking en vaca muerta y así la lista continúa. Mientras tanto, hay un Estado ausente, sin voluntad política, pese a que existen presentados 13 proyectos de leyes que buscan proteger y conservar a los humedales. Lamentablemente, de no tratarse en las próximas semanas, el proyecto presente de ley va a volver a perder Estado parlamentario. ¿En qué sector está trabado el proyecto de ley? En la Comisión de Agricultura y Ganadería, más claro imposible donde nosotros vemos un ecosistema muriendo, ellos ven progreso. En fin, por donde lo miremos, el modo extractivista es el principal destructor del humedal. Pese al encierro decretado por el gobierno argentino y las restricciones ante la situación sanitaria, los y las rosarinas salieron de sus casas a documentar por sus propios medios, como un acto revolucionario y de manifestación socioambiental, la destrucción y el ecocidio que se estaba llevando a cabo en los humedales. Así fue como empezó a llegar material por las diferentes redes sociales y decidí armar un banco de imagen con todos esos, esos archivos de, de los ciudadanos. Empecé a utilizar la plataforma de Instagram como una herramienta de visibilización y denuncia pública para dar a conocer lo que, se estaba, lo que estaba aconteciendo acá en el territorio. En este contexto me surgió una pregunta fundamental para mi propia práctica fotográfica. ¿Qué papel pasa a desempeñar la fotografía en un territorio en conflicto? ¿O puede una imagen generar empatía social con el territorio en que habitamos? ¿Puede una imagen aportar a la lucha ecoactivista? Fue entonces que casi sin pensarlo me estaba convirtiendo en un activista en defensa por los humedales. Esto sin duda marcó un antes y un después en mi trabajo. Con el apoyo de National Geographic comencé a realizar un registro propio de la situación con el objetivo de trabajar y visibilizar la situación de las comunidades isleñas en plena pandemia y cómo estos se adaptaban a los cambios del territorio por el fuego y la sequía. Acceder a las comunidades en estos momentos eh, constituía un gran riesgo por la presencia constante del fuego y por mi carencia en equipos aptos para la situación. Poner el cuerpo no solo es peligroso, sino también me hizo ser espectador de un, de un escenario catastrófico. Me ha tocado escuchar y ver animales calcinados y en reiteradas ocasiones he tenido que dejar la cámara de lado para cargar baldes de agua e intentar salvar hogares del fuego. Sin embargo, nunca dudé que tenía que ir y registrar lo que estaba pasando. 
este ecocidio me toca en lo personal, ya que están destruyendo un territorio con el cual estoy familiarizado desde muy niño y representa mucho de lo que soy hoy. Y ahora busco, a partir de mis imágenes, transmutar el dolor en lucha, la imagen como fuerza social. Well, we're here at the end of the day, um, and we've had a session um, all about different ways of um, creating monuments in our time and preserving um, the cultures of history, but also creating and um, manifesting the important issues and um, moments and experiences um, that we're sharing at the moment. And this, right now, we're going to be talking to a filmmaker. Matthew Heinemann, um, who has made one of the most extraordinary films, I think, of the past um, two years, a, um, a project that has explored the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic um, here in New York that follows um, the frontline workers at a hospital in Queens. And um, we're going to be having a discussion about how film and culture and community come together. Um, to create another kind of monument. Um, so we're going to cut to um, the trailer and then Matthew and I are going to have a short conversation. to keep it together. I have kids who can't see me fall apart. He has to come home. He has no choice. And just let my fear be my strength, because I know one day I'm going to be with my wife and my baby. It is because of you that we are going to make it through. You are more than just a doctor. You do it from the heart. Every time you see the COVID patient, you can't help but say, damn, this can easily be my mom. Each one is getting harder and harder. It's tough to see people constantly have to suffer. When we started chanting, I literally felt like my breath was stripped away. I also heard all the times my patients said, I can't breathe. Guys, we need some help in here now. Wait, stop. I have a pulse. Uh, I have a pulse right here. Pulse, pulse, pulse. What we've been doing here over the last number of weeks is extraordinary and special. And you are fearful, you are stressed, but you raise the bar each and every day that you get up and come to work. We weren't made for this, but I think this made us. I'm tired of seeing people like you in the hospital. Your family cares about you. You got people who care about you. So, um, Matthew, I want to go back um, to the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020. Um, you had, you were a documentary filmmaker and you were living in New York, um, and you start to investigate this idea of pursuing a documentary about the pandemic itself at the beginning of the pandemic. Can you set the scene for us a little bit? Like, what was, for those people that weren't here um, in New York at the time, like, what was it, what was it like? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it was terrifying. I mean, you know, we, had, we knew so little about, obviously, the, the science of, of COVID, of, of how it was transmitted. It felt like this ex sort of apocalyptic movie. The, the streets were empty, the, you know, being punctuated by almost minute-to-minute -minute sirens, and, um, which I don't think any New Yorker will ever forget. 
And I think as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, as a journalist, whatever I am, um, I felt this enormous obligation to try to capture this moment, to try to put a human face to it. We were so inundated with stats and misinformation and headlines, but we weren't like viscerally connecting to it. And I think honestly, that's one of the greatest tragedies of COVID is that um, you know, the general public didn't see what was happening. And I, you know, there's a reason journalism exists. There's a reason why war correspondents go to war zones. Those images um, inform public opinion. They inform public discourse. And I think that's part of what allowed this very partisan rhetoric to fester and to, to grow. And that's another reason why I felt this just enormous obligation to try to get inside there and show what was really happening without the politics, without the stats, but showing what, what was happening to individual doctors, nurses, and patients. And in the actual hospitals themselves, you were there with your crews, you didn't know how the virus spread, you didn't know if you were actively um, gonna contribute in a way. I mean, wh how did you deal with those tensions, those realities of, the, of filming on the front line? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, having filmed in a bunch of conflict zones uh, on various projects and various films over the years, you know, you can sort of come back to New York where I live and um, turn off your brain. Whereas this, you know, we were living the same thing we were documenting. Um, it, it was a sort of 24 seven full on experience for not just weeks, but months. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of trauma and, and death and other stuff that we witness on a daily basis. Um, but I think the overarching feeling, and I, and I can speak on behalf of my amazing crew, is um, there was also so much love and fortitude and courage that we witnessed um, every single hour. And I think that's what pushed us to keep making this film is, is you know, I think if, if I was gonna distill it down to one thing, it's about how human beings come together in the face of crisis, and, and that was a really beautiful thing to witness. I mean, the, um, I 100% I agree, and I think that the, the, the human face that you're describing, um, the, the feeling of having, having a face to this crisis, which was the frontline workers, and one of the, the themes, again, of this session that we're speaking um, in, and actually closing the show, um, is about the about making those invisible forces that, that shape our lives and those sort of um, less visible communities that make the city run, right? And I think in New York it became so clear at that time, like who makes the city run, like who gets to stop working and who doesn't get to stop working. Um, and you're you witnessing that and broadcasting that and sharing that um, has, I think, has like such an agency and such an important agency. Yeah, you know, I think the two patients that we followed, one was a New York City cop, one was a nurse, you know, they're representative of all the, you know, essential workers, the frontline workers that were most likely to get sick. Um, you know, it became very clear also within the first couple of weeks that this virus was, you know, very clearly disproportionately impacting people of color. You don't need to be a scientist or an epidemiologist, you just need to walk through the ICUs and observe that. And, you know, the film also became a sort of exploration of, of that as well, um, especially um, in following our principal doctor, Dr. J, who's a first generation American from, from Haiti, who, you know, after George Floyd was killed, joined the protests in these, what previously were completely empty streets, now filled with thousands and thousands of people um, speaking out against systemic racism, which is also obviously intricately tied to uh, that disproportionate impact of, of the virus. Um, these all just became themes that we explored naturally over the course of this sort of four month document in time. And I, I totally agree that, that that was the moment that the health crisis became a civic crisis and it became a social crisis. And um, that part of, I think, what's interesting to us about this um, film, as well as being, um, you know, how important it is to bear witness to these events and to, um, to archive them. But also, I'm interested to know what you think about this idea of making a monument and documentary filmmaking as 
um, as a way of preserving, as a different type of preservation. Um, do you think about that, and how, do you, how would you imagine this film kind of contributing to the history of, um, of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think probably more so than any film I've ever made, I felt this just self, probably self-imposed, but this enormous weight on my shoulders that um, we were documenting this once in a lifetime event. And I also knew that, you know, it was so difficult to get access inside hospitals. Um, and I only was able to get, do it, you know, through a connection in a previous film that I made about healthcare. And so I knew that, you know, no one really had the access that we had. And so that I felt even more weight on my shoulders to, to document this moment. Um, and yeah, and, and I was aware that this, whether, I don't know if it was gonna be, you know, what, what type of film it would be, how, what the reception would be, but I knew on some basic level that it would be, you know, a historical testament to these four months. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was very much something that I was conscientious of uh, throughout the making of it. I mean, every single person on earth has been touched by COVID in some way. And I hope the film provides a vehicle through which we can reflect on all that we've been through. Um, how have we changed? How have we changed as a society? How have we changed as individuals? Um, how can we apply that to the present? And how can we apply that to the future? Um, that's one of the many things that I hope people uh, sort of explore and feel as, as they're watching the film. And Matthew, you're a, you're a filmmaker, as you said, you're not sure if you're a journalist or a documentary filmmaker. I, th I think that ultimately you're a storyteller and um, much of what we try to, to do with our conference and our project is also about um, telling, finding ways to tell the most important stories of like current affairs, but through culture and through art practice. And I'd love to know just to finish, like what um, what motivates you to be a storyteller, and what what um, what do you get out of it as well as a professional? I, I don't know. I mean, I think I feel extraordinarily lucky to do what I do. Um, what a privilege every year or two to dive into another world and explore it. And um, I think if there's one through line through my work, it's it's sort of what you just said. It's trying to take these massive amorphous subjects um, that we read about every day in the paper and we talk about at dinner at bars or whatever but we it's hard to viscerally connect to these things often whether it's the you know drug war in Mexico or it's ISIS in Syria or the Afghan war I just I was there um, in the final months um, or in, in this case, in, in, with COVID, you know, trying to take these, these massive things and, and trying to make you feel, you know? I think every single day in the edit room, every single day in the field, I constantly say, let's, let's let the audience get inside the shoes of, of a doctor as they're running down the hallway when someone's coding. Um, let's let them feel what those empty streets felt like. Let's, let, let's put them in those places and, and let them emotionally connect. Because I think that's the only, you know, that empathetic connection is what allows us to really think and care and feel, um, and then hopefully generates conversation around these, these issues in a way that, you know, you didn't feel necessarily connected before. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to end, and thank you and congratulations on such an extraordinary film and project. Um, and thank you for sharing your time with us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you for all sharing our time uh, and spending this day with us together. That is a wrap um, for the World Around Summit 2022. Um, we actually uh, pre-recorded that yesterday because um, Matthew, being a documentary uh, filmmaker, uh, was going to be here today, but we, we recorded it yesterday. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say how, uh, you know, how much I appreciate everybody who's put time and effort into coming here physically and spending this time with us, including the speakers, um, our tech team here, our producer, Satomi Blair, um, who is um, just extraordinary person and thank you so much for all of your huge effort today and all of the Guggenheim team who's just been fantastic. Um, the new institute who are our European partner, 
couldn't have, could not have done this without you, and we're so proud to have you um, as part of our teams. Um, there's all of the thanks um, in the in the in the program, um, but also I just wanted to, to just note um, our our board and our sponsors. Again, um, we are a non-profit institution, and we cannot do this alone. And we are made possible because of all of you. So thank you so much. Um, we're storytellers, you know, this is our, you know, I'm a curator and this is a team of storytellers and I really hope that you've enjoyed these stories today. It's, um, we believe they matter. Uh, we believe that architecture and design has, a, has an important role in telling stories and um, we hope that it, you know, kind of resonated with you and hopefully see you again as part of our future programming. And uh, thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.